welcome back to Spotlights, the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. I'm your host, Sam Mickey, and this week I'm bringing you the second part of our two-part interview with Sandy Bigtree of the Indigenous Values Initiative. And our discussion picks up where we're getting into the roots of the whole problem of colonialism in the doctrines of discovery. So I'll let Sandy take it from here. I know we go back to um, the, the root of all of this problem. And um, one, one subject we cover at SCANO, of course, uh, and we, um, we have conferences every year about the doctrines of discovery. Mm. And, you know, that was, um, they were written in the 15th century, and pretty much um, they were papal bulls that were issued. It issued the whole age of discovery that any Christian could go into a non-Christian territory and claim it as their own and take all the resources and enslave all the people um, forever, right? And this is, a, this is a major problem. You're talking about what can um, this other side do that is not indigenous, um, need to educate everybody about what has gone on historically. Um, because, because this annihilation of indigenous people happened in Europe before it came here. Right. And, and it's a direct lineage from the Roman Empire, you know, and then becoming, you know, this, this papal decree to just ravage and steal everything all over the world. The first one pertained to Africa, and then the mm -hmm. second one pertained to the Americas with Columbus. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it gives right to title, to land. Even, even at the Scano Center, um, when those Jesuits came in 1656, they arrived with a deed to 600 square miles of land in 1656. Wow. Claimed it all their own. And we've got the, the document, a copy of it on display. And it's right there in your face. Um, everyone has been controlled to enable uh, monarchies to just ravage the land. That's yeah. where all the, the money's gone. Um, but we have a conference every year. Um, I think you're you're hearing more about it. Not enough, though. I mean, it really needs to get out there. It's a major topic at the UN. Um, we're fiscal sponsors for the American Indian Law Alliance, um, and and they take on these issues at the United Nations, and they've been doing it for uh, thirty years or, or more. Um, Orrin Lyons was very active. Uh -huh and a lot of addressing these issues pertaining to environment and human rights and justice and all of that. And um, it's, um, it's kind of um, right at the forefront <laughs> yeah. of this issue. So um, anyway. Yeah, I know, uh, you know, living in Northern California these last few years, we've just been hit with terrible wildfires and wildfire season. And mm -hmm. people have pointed out, you know, one of the reasons is because uh, the native inhabitants of the land haven't been allowed to practice their cultural practice of controlled burns. Yeah. And people are like, yeah, climate change is part of it, sure, sure. But the solution is indigenous sovereignty. And mm -hmm. uh, so this kind of reclaiming these histories and collaborating, it's really, you know, just simply a matter of, of life and death. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's a thing that needs to happen in our educational system where people realize how, how terrible that history is and how much it's hurt everybody. I think sometimes people are like, Oh, the, the oppressor is okay. The oppressed person gets off bad. I'm like it ultimately it's destroying everybody. It's destroying everybody. Yep. Absolutely. And the doctrine of discovery is still alive and active in property law in the United States. Mm -hmm. And Justice um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually quoted um, the doctrines of discovery in her very first footnote denying um, the Oneida land claim. Really? In 2005. Wow. Because it would overturn the doctrines of discovery. And they were like, we can't do that. You may think it's an ancient document, but it's so relevant to this um, governance. Unbelievable. Today. Yeah. If they overturned that, then all kinds of land back initiatives would have right. to go through. Yeah. Interesting. All right. 
So I think attacking the doctrines of discovery has got to be <laughs> high on people's list at this point. But it has to do with how food is grown, how corporations can just move in and dictate how you're going to eat. Right. I mean, it's really connected to who has the right to do that. Yeah. But it really goes back to those doctrines saying um, it just set the system in place, you know, authoritative uh, voice. And now it's not so much pertaining to uh, religion as it is to power right. in corporations. Yeah. So it's um, terrible. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty terrible. In general, working with like environmental justice issues always feels like that's like just so heartbreaking and just so terrible. And mm -hmm. yet, working with other people who are in this field is always feels very empowering. And when you hear about all the good things that are happening, there's so much good and so much bad at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, how do you keep, I don't know, like, emotionally stable doing this kind of work, right? It's, it's very <laughs> difficult. And I think, I mean, especially this last year with the pandemic, everybody's just so exhausted. And like, how do you, how do you stay motivated? Or it's like, what's a tip that you could give to other folks who are maybe feeling a little depressed or anxious or, you know, dealing with the grief and the loss? Uh, what's, what's a way to stay, I don't know, hopeful, or I don't know if that's even the right word. You've got to be active. You've got to be engaged. It is really depressing. And um, it's been a difficult year, you know, not really being able to do what we usually do. Um, I know a lot of, I have such a dear friend. <laughs> she takes everything so seriously. She's always like spraining her foot or breaking her back or, <laughs> I mean, you do, you, you take it physically and it really does wear and tear on your health. Um, but you've got to keep active. Um, I don't know. The more people that do it, the sooner there'll be a change, right? Right. But a grief is certainly something that was at the core of establishing the Hood and Shoni. Um, that's a, a, one of the first steps that was taken to returning back to peace. Hmm. They had fallen from um, their original instructions, and and um, there was a lot of murder. There was a great sorcerer called the Tadadao who was in charge of all the um, indigenous people in this area. And a peacemaker came to Onondaga Lake thousands of years ago. And um, he knew he had to turn this, the mind around of this um, violent sorcerer. And so um, he set about to bring all the the different nations together. And the first person he encountered was a woman and her name is Jaconsa Say. And he recognized her huge heart. And what he did was, um, cause she fed both sides. She wouldn't take sides. She just loved everybody. He said, but I have a bigger task for you and you need to reinstate the clan identity with women. We need to go into the forest and we need to start back to this proper relationship with the natural world. And so it began with her establishing um, the clan system again. And then it went and he went next to Hiawatha who was laden with grief because five of his daughters had been burned or uh, murdered in war, not burned, but murdered. And um, so he condoled Hiawatha um, and because Hiawatha needed to speak clearly and no one can have clear words if, if they're emotionally distraught. Mm. So they went through this process of condolence. And so um, wampum belts were used to condole him mm. and bring about this rebalancing of his body in this ritual. And um, those wampum beads are what were used even through today in wampum belts. Mm. Any kind of agreement with the United States or other countries or other native nations, wampum belts are the exchange never was money. It was this ritual object. And um, so these agreements would be made with the underlying tone that these are the wampum beads that condoled Hiawatha. So if you don't uphold this agreement, then you're going to have grief mm. and you'll return back to that state of despair. So grief and acknowledgement and condolence is all embedded in all the documentation of these wampum belts, right? So when everyone joined, they were able to 
to turn the mind of Tata Dao. And um, he became the central focus of the Haudenosaunee. He became what could be interpreted as a president of these five nations hmm. because he had turned around the farthest, the peacemaker appointed him the central figurehead of all of this. So that title is still held by um, Sid Hill today at the Ondaga Nation. He speaks at the United Nations. All 50 titles, in fact, that were um, distributed to these different clan lead um, representatives still exist today. And those title holders meet regularly at Onondaga, the Central Fire. So this is a, such an ancient tradition that is still in effect. And um, the core of that is condolence. And they brought it around and, and they lived in peace for thousands of years by the time Europeans came here. Right. Wow, that's remarkable. Yeah. And to think that, you know, the foundations for that kind of political solidarity have this emotional component. We often think emotions, ah, that's not a big part of politics should be just purely rational. Right. Uh, yeah. Maybe we're missing something there. And uh, especially to think that grieving as well as gratitude, right? That these kinds of things are mm -hmm. essential for the political process. Uh, I think um, that's just sorely, sorely lacking. We don't have a lot of tools for that. And it's like, well, wait, there's this history right here. Right? Mm -hmm. we, and we can uh, yeah. use that kind of history and reconstruct that to maybe bring some grieving practices uh, back into our own lives now. And transform American democracy to what it should have, could have uh, become had they yeah. listened or had the ability, you know, to listen. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes me feel pretty good uh, to know that there's still a possibility for democracy. Yeah. <laughs> there's, that they're really, you know, it's not going to be easy, uh, but there is uh, there's communities, there's people who are working on it, especially mm -hmm. intact traditions like that. Uh, that's that's really special. And I think the more that Americans realize the origins of American democracy, right. and that real history, uh, then we could mobilize really quickly and we could see a lot of change rapidly. I think so. And the unifier is the earth and the water and the air, the land. Yeah. I like that's that a great yeah. unifier for sure. That our the common ground we have is is our literal it's common actually. ground. Actually, yeah. <laughs> how are it's we going to find common concept. ground? <laughs> like it's right. It's just right here. It's, it's the ground. How hard that's is that? <laughs> oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, well, what's coming up next for you? What do you got uh, going on? What are you looking ahead to for for your work or any new projects? Um, we're going to have a um, wooden stick festival. Hmm. Lacrosse also, the first games were played at Onondaga Lake. And oh. lacrosse is a medicine game among clan people, oh. which you, that's all you need to know about that. But it's very complicated and it involves cosmology hmm. who we're part of. And so it's um, a very ancient, sacred game. And it was originally played as part of the peacemaking process among the men at Onondaga Lake thousands of years ago. So this is also the birthplace of the cross as we know it today, um, not to take away from all the other ball games that were played <laughs> all over the Americas, but this, this game particularly came from the Haudenosaunee. And um, so we have a festival every year at Onondaga Lake to try to bring people down there and you know teach them about this sacred place and also the sacred sport. <laughs> right. Um, that's the origin of all sports, really. It came so um, commercialized, commodified, you know, but, yeah. uh, but it, is, it is a sacred, all sports are sacred. You, you never experience in your body, you know, yeah. have the opportunity to experience that unless you're an artist or a singer or in the arts or right. performance or sports. So, mm. uh, it contributes so much to so many people. So we're having that in... Um, um, the 11th and 12th of September. <laughs> so, <you have> to <laughs> give me. Um, the 11th and 12th of September. And we have it right on the shores of Onondaga Lake. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. There's, um, it's all outdoors, and they play with wooden sticks and leather balls. And the backdrop is the gorgeous lake. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we'll be having a Doctrine of uh, Discovery conference again. Um, in the fall, we haven't set the date yet, but we do have a website that 
if you, if you are interested and would like to check in, it's indigenousvalues.org. Nice. Yeah, I'll make sure to uh, to add a link to that when I post this too. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's a great great way to connect. Yeah. And geez, that's that sounds fun. Uh, I, I don't think I'll be able to make it all the way to the East Coast. It's tough. I try not to travel that much, but if it's getting, you know, oh, I know. things like that, then it feels pretty justifiable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. And I'll definitely keep an eye out for the Dr. E Discovery Conference. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't think I realized how, uh, what, pernicious and insidious that is. It's kind of, it's, I, did, I was under the yeah. impression it's like, no, people are criticizing it. It's going away gradually. I didn't realize yeah. how persistent yeah. it was. Uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, I appreciate that. Well, all right. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but oh, one you. more thing. What would be one tip that you could give folks who want to get uh, more involved with this work aside from Indigenous Values Initiative? Is there a book? that you'd recommend, or maybe just a simple practice, just one kind of tip for, for people who want to get a little more involved? Um, well, it's all about education. And that's all we're doing, you know, the Indigenous Values Initiative. I mean, certainly scope out the Indigenous communities in your area, mm -hmm. you know, and work with them, listen to them, give them a platform to speak. Um, contact your legislators who are silencing voices and you know there's um certainly work at, at every corner because this continent is full of indigenous peoples um we have um oh the scano center you can go on that site you can get the uh, thanksgiving address booklet it's in mm. over a dozen different languages um you can go to scano what is the can find it through our site because we're different. Scano is still through the Historical Association. Okay. Right. Uh, we we still uh, schedule all the conferences and you know, the right. major work that needs to be happening there. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, in our site, there's links to the American Indian Law Alliance. You can see what's going on at the United Nations. Um, I don't know. That's. That's yeah. That's Our great. books, Exiled in the Land of the Free, it is written by, <laughs> edited by Orrin Lyons and John Mohawk. Um, basic Call to Consciousness, yeah. Basic uh, Call to consciousness, consciousness. Consciousness, it was about a trip they took to Geneva oh. in, 19, I think it was 1977. There were a lot of indigenous leaders that went over there to address the UN. Um, the American Religious Freedom Act wasn't passed until 1978. So you were punished, right. spoke of your religion or your culture. So as soon as that veil started to lift, I mean, they were right to the UN in Geneva as soon as they could right. talk about the injustices. Mm. But basic call to consciousness is quite a, an, an eye opener. Mm. And Exiled in the Land of the Free is another really great book. Um, we have, I think, bibliographies on our website as well, indigenousvalues.org, not to keep promoting that, but that's where we <laughs> no, try, that's try to why focus here. it all yeah. to make it accessible to people, you know? Exactly. Uh-huh. Um, let's see. Also, uh, doctrineofdiscovery.org. Um, we, we kind of handle that as well to learn more about that. We have speakers like Stephen Newcomb, who mm -hmm. started, you know, this fire lit the fire like 30 years ago um uh, yeah nice that's great those are a lot of good sources a lot of directions to to go and uh and you've left me feeling good about the future so so thanks oh, can't can't lose hope it's yeah difficult right. sometimes but <laughs> yeah you can't i mean we're we still have water to drink and air yeah that's hasn't a good given point. up so we have no right to give up yet you know that's a great way um, to put it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Earth hasn't given up. We're not yeah. giving up. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's great. Perfect. I can't imagine a better note to end on. Earth hasn't <laughs> given up. We're not giving up. That's uh, right. Well, geez, Sandy Big Tree, thanks for coming on. Really Thank appreciate you. it. And Thank uh, and thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back next week with uh, another episode for you. In the meantime, take care and be well.